Hi, these are the top 10 films of the early 1930s, covering the years 1930 to 1932. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. Cheers. In at number 10, Frankenstein, one of the great early universal horror films. If you're asked to picture the monster from Mary Shelley's novel, you're likely to picture Boris Karloff in his outstanding makeup from this 1931 adaptation. In the novel, he has long black hair, big white teeth, and yellowish, almost transparent skin pulled tightly over his body. So a lot of credit has to be given to makeup artist Jack P. Pierce, and a lot of credit to Karlov. His performance of the monster is brilliant, balancing on that fine line of being monstrous but also childlike. There's no monster without his creator though, and Colin Clive is equally good as the Mad Doctor and he nails the immortal line of It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> My only issue with the film is how the Mad Doctor forgets that he's engaged and eventually remembers and is totally sane for the rest of the film and even survives at the end and lives happily ever after. He caused all this bloody mess. A poor girl has been drowned for fuck's sake. With this ending, the film's message seems to be playing God is slightly risky. In a number nine, a nous la liberté. René Clair's fabulous comedy, which has a lot to say. Telling the story of two convicts, we see them in prison being treated like machines as they work on an assembly line making toys. Two of them try to escape and one of them manages it. And over the years, he becomes rich by setting up a company that makes record players. The man who failed to escape is eventually released from prison and by chance ends up working at the record player factory. Well, it's no different from prison people being poorly treated while working on assembly lines. It doesn't sound particularly funny, but it really is. There are plenty of great gags, and you can see the influence that it would have on Jacques Tati, and one of the sequences here would even be ripped off by Charlie Chaplin in modern times. It's a funny film, but it has things to say about society and how the world and the structures that we set up can trap people. The only problem with the film is a moment where they show that new machines can do the work for the workers and then shows the workers finally being free, fishing and dancing. So not really taking into account the fact that they're now unemployed and are no longer needed. But this is a fantastic film and one of Claire's best. One of the great comedies of the 1930s. In a number eight, La Chienne. We're sticking with French cinema with this dark comedy? The literal translation of the title is The Bitch. But understandably, in English-speaking countries, it was never released as that. Jean Renoir pulls no punches here. We follow a dull and unloved man, played by Michel Simon. One night, he stumbles across a woman being beaten by her abusive boyfriend. He intervenes and eventually falls in love with the woman. He puts her up in an apartment and they begin an affair. Unbeknownst to him, the abusive boyfriend is all for this. And both him and the woman begin using Simon for his money the woman not caring for him at all, but still being in love with her awful abusive pimp. There are some really funny moments, but it's a very, very dark film. The story behind the film is equally dark. Much like the love triangle that was at the center of the movie, a similar thing happened during production. Simon fell in love with Jeanne Marez, but she started having an affair with the man playing her pimp, Georges Flamand. Renoir and the producer encouraged all of this, feeling it added to all three actors' performances. When production wrapped, Flamand took Marais on a drive in the south of France. Flamand could barely drive and soon crashed the car. He survived, but Marais did not. She was only 23 years old. At her funeral, Simon was in a state. He fainted and even had to be supported as he walked past the coffin. He blamed Renoir for her death and threatened him with a gun, to which Renoir stated, kill me if you like but I have made the film. It's a horrible story behind a great film. In a number seven, Freaks. I love and hate this film in equal measure. One of the best examples of a film having its cake and eating it. The story takes place in a traveling circus and most of the cast is made up of people with various disabilities. The film has been praised for humanizing its cast and showing them as people with the same joys and passions as everyone else and for having disabled actors alongside the rest of the cast, being friends and even lovers. It has been seen as an anti-eugenics picture. The film even shows people who mock disabled people or use them for profit as villainous. This is all great, 
but the film does also relish in trying to show these people as something odd. It humanises them, but also mocks them as well, and even shows them as terrifying monsters in one scene. It works as a film though, and it features great performances. Harry Earls, a little person actor and performer, was the first one to suggest that director Todd Browning make the film. He appears in the film alongside his sister, and both are excellent in it. They would also later both appear as munchkins in The Wizard of Oz. It's worth looking up all the performers. They lived hard but fascinating lives. And most of them seem to look back on freaks with fondness, but some, including the bearded lady, Jane Barnell, did not like how they were portrayed. It's an odd film, a great film, an upsetting film, a difficult film. It's hard to know quite what to think about it, but it's full of scenes and moments that instantly stay with you, for better or for worse. In a number six, City Lights. One of Charlie Chaplin's best films. Talkies had been around for four years, but Chaplin was not convinced by them, even going so far as to say he only gave them three years tops. He decided to keep City Lights a silent film. This might have also been that he was a little scared by the move to sound. He had done wonders without it for decades. He said himself, I was a pantomimist, and in that medium I was unique and without false modesty, a master. He had a big ego, but I guess he earned it. Well, City Lights proved that there was still an audience for the silent picture. It did great business and is still considered one of the greatest comedies of all time. Chaplin was a genius at mixing the funny with the dark and depressing. Telling the story of how the tramp falls in love with a blind flower seller and his strange relationship with a suicidal drunk millionaire, Chaplin is one of the few people who can make a scene about a man trying to drown himself humorous. He was also brilliant at romance. The ending of the film where the flower seller can finally see again and sees the tramp for the first time is one of the great emotional endings in cinema. In a number five, I am a fugitive from a chain gang. For my money, this is the first great prison film. This really set the stage for later films such as Cool Hand Luke and The Shawshank Redemption. It shows the brutal treatment of prisoners on a train gang in Georgia. Paul Muni plays a World War I veteran who, upon returning from the war, feels a little lost in the world. He wanders America, looking for his place. He winds up broke and accidentally finds himself in the middle of a heist at a small diner. He is arrested and placed on a chain gang. The bullying and poor conditions are expertly shown and get your blood boiling. We don't hear what the other prisoners are in for, and it doesn't matter. What matters is how poorly they are treated by the state. Eventually Muni escapes in one of the great escape sequences. You're on the edge of your seat not knowing what will happen. The rest of the film is full of twists and turns, and what's amazing is that it's all based on a true story. It's based on Robert Elliot Burns' autobiography. He was a man who escaped the chain gang twice, and after the film's release, was caught again. The film had such an impact on the public and America's perception of chain gangs that he was eventually pardoned and released. The film is also credited as being one of the major reasons for the demise of the chain gangs in the South, a great example of the political power of cinema. In a number four, M, Fritz Lang's first talkie, and he's already mastered the use of sound. This is a very, very dark film. There is a serial killer on the loose in Berlin who is targeting children. You never see a child be harmed, but Lang uses subtle images to have you picture the crimes yourself, making it that much more horrifying. Peter Lorre stars as the murderer and is instantly fascinating. He has such cinematic presence, and the speech where he explains how he can't help himself is powerful stuff. Lorre whistles in the Hall of the Mountain King throughout the movie. And this is used as a leitmotif, signalling his arrival. And it's even used as a plot point. The film is also one of the first police procedurals. Although some of their methods seem a little odd. When there's a paedophile murder on the loose, do you really arrest known gangsters and raid bars? And eventually they're looking for someone with a wooden table and a red pencil, which presumably was most children in Berlin in 1931. But this is a brilliant film. It looks absolutely gorgeous, and there are stunning long tracking shots. Lang was a master of the silent film, and immediately proved that he was a master of the talkie. In a number three, The Public Enemy. This crime film is based on an unpublished novel with a fantastic title, Blood and Beer. It's one of the first great gangster films. In the early 1930s, the organised crime picture started a take-off with Scarface and Little Caesar. But The Public Enemy stands out due to James Cagney's outstanding performance and William A. Wellman's solid direction. 
we follow a man's rise in organized crime, from being an unruly kid in the early 1900s to small crime in the 1910s, but it's prohibition that pushes him up the ranks and makes him rich. It's fascinating to watch a film made so soon after Prohibition ended, and it expertly shows how pointless it was, how it led to violence and to violent men making big bucks. Cagney is perfect in it, menacing but with tons of charisma. Complex character brilliantly pulled off. He's completely selfish, and there is the famous scene where he gets fed up with his wife and lashes out at her at breakfast. Maybe you found someone you like better. Cagney is the prototype for the unhinged gangster in film. Much like James Kahn in The Godfather, Come here. Hey. Joe Pesci in Goodfellas, Funny how. and Tony Soprano. Fucking goddamn fucking bitch! God damn it, Tony! There is a brilliant episode of The Sopranos where Tony gets overwhelmed with emotion while watching Public Enemy after his mother died. The ending of Public Enemy is great. While I'd say that the ending of The Sopranos was... In at number two, All Quiet on the Western Front. One of the greatest war films of all time. Based on a German novel, here we have a bunch of Americans playing Germans in the Great War. It's quite amazing seeing an American film from the Germans' perspective. World War I was not like World War II. There wasn't this sense of good versus evil. In this conflict, it was just millions of young men killing each other for seemingly nothing. In this film, we follow a class of young German men who sign up. We follow them through the horrors of war. There are so many memorable moments in the film. One scene in particular stands out for me. The men are terrified of an incoming attack. There is complete tension and a look of fear on their faces as they sit behind their machine guns. Then, when the attack comes, you were terrified for them. What's amazing is this is seeing things from a German's perspective. We usually follow British, French or American troops running towards the guns and getting mowed down. Here we see that the men on the other side of those guns were scared young men, terrified of the approaching enemy. The film looks stunning and has a wonderful sense of scale. The scene where the elderly teacher convinces his class to sign up for the army gets you furious. The training segments are funny and get you to care about each of them. And then as they begin to die, one by one, a sense of tragedy builds and builds and is almost unbearable. A really powerful film, made even more powerful knowing that within ten years it was all going to happen again. And in at number one, The Blue Angel. The first feature length German talkie is the film that made Marlena Dietrich a star. The characters, the audience, the camera, and certainly the director all fall in love with Dietrich. She has such a presence on screen. Fed up with life, but with so much life within her. She is absolutely captivating. They filmed two versions at the same time, one in English and one in German. The German one is of course the one to watch, as the English version is harder to understand. It tells the story of a German school professor who falls for a cabaret performer and slowly begins to lose respect and his sanity. Emil Jannings is brilliant as the professor and does every stage of the transformation superbly. He is top billing and is great in it, but Dietrich still manages to steal the film from him. On set, Jannings could see that the focus of the film was going further and further away from him. He began to throw tantrums and apparently even threatened to throttle Dietrich. The making of the film has a kind of a star is born-esque feeling, where Janning's career as a worldwide star was coming to an end and Dietrich was about to go from strength to strength and become one of the biggest stars in the world. Her audition tape is available and you can see why director Joseph von Sternberg cast her. Jungs, was fällt dir eigentlich ein? Soll es Klavier spielen sein? So dem Dreck soll ich singen? Du hast einen Waschdruck, aber nicht hier. Stehst du? Dussel. You're the cream in my coffee. You're the salt in my stew. You will always be my necessity. I'm at loss without you. She has a world weary s quality in it that she says was because she didn't think she had a chance of being cast. She and Sternberg started an affair, and they would work together six more times. The films differ in quality, but Dietrich is always wonderful, especially in Morocco and Shanghai Express. Her singing in the Blue Angel of Falling in Love Again is iconic. 
in the 1930s, Germany was going through huge changes. If you take three actors from the Blue Angel, you get a fascinating look at the nightmares that were soon to occur. Dietrich had strong political views, and in the late 30s helped Jewish people escape Germany. Her entire salary for Night Without Armour went on helping refugees. She was one of the first stars to raise war bonds, and toured and played for the Allied troops throughout the war. She was awarded the Medal of Freedom for her work by Harry S. Truman in 1945. Meanwhile, Emil Jannings made Nazi propaganda films for Goebbels. Dietrich loathed Jannings for his friendship and work with the Nazi party, calling him a ham. I can think of a lot more harsher words to describe him. The third actor to talk about is Kurt Geron. He plays the magician and head of the cabaret troupe. He was a successful actor, director and singer in Germany. Three years after the Blue Angel, Geron and his family left Germany and settled in Amsterdam. They were Jewish. When the Nazis occupied the Netherlands, he was taken to a concentration camp and was forced to perform for the SS and later to make a propaganda film. Once filming had wrapped on it, he and his wife were put on a train to Auschwitz and died in the gas chambers in 1944. Three Germans who had three very different fates in the coming years. And it's a good example of how the first country that the Nazis took over was Germany. The Blue Angel is an astonishing film. It's intoxicating and full of real human moments. One of the best films of the 1930s and of the 20th century. Right, so counting down the top 10. In a number 10, Frankenstein. In a number 9, A nous la liberté. In a number 8, La Chienne. In a number 7, Freaks. In a number 6, City Lights. In a number 5, I am a fugitive from a chain gang. In a number 4, M. In a number three, The Public Enemy. In a number two, All Quiet on the Western Front. And in a number one, The Blue Angel. Well, those are my top 10 films from 1930 to 1932. What are your top films from 1930 to 1932? Cheers.